What planets could you see if you peered up into a clear night sky with your unaided eye? Technically, all of them, with the exception of Neptune, would be visible to you at some point. In addition to being the smallest of the gas giants, it is also the most distant. It's also a confusing location. A planet so far from the sun defies logic by having a dynamic atmosphere with enormous storms and extremely swift winds. Why then is this planet so fascinating? Welcome to Z, where today we'll explore everything there is to know about Neptune. Let's begin at the very beginning. The only planet discovered through mathematical prediction is Neptune. See, astronomers realized that Uranus wasn't conforming to their models when they were mapping its orbit after it was found. Urbain Louverrier deduced that there must be another unknown planet in 1846 based on the altered Uranus orbit. He predicted its location, and miraculously Johann Gall was able to detect it only a degree away from his prediction. A few days later, the largest moon of Neptune, Triton, was found. Since then, little has been known about Neptune because of how far it is from Earth and how small it appears to be, making it difficult to study with ground-based telescopes. It wasn't until 1989, with the arrival of Voyager 2, that a vast amount of knowledge about the planet became accessible. Suddenly, we could observe the planet's appearance, were able to confirm the presence of planetary rings, and found numerous previously unidentified moons. Now let's focus on today. What are the current facts regarding this planet? Neptune is the eighth planet from the Sun and is the farthest since Pluto lost its planet classification. It typically orbits the Sun at a distance of around 30 Australian dollars, which is 30 times further than the Earth's orbit. In other terms, 30 Australian dollars is 4.5 billion kilometers, which explains why it would take a space probe 13 years to travel to Neptune with present technology. A significant distance is 4.5 billion kilometers. Since the discovery of the Neptunian year, we have only witnessed one of its enormous 165-year-long orbits around the Sun. Since Neptune is so far from the Sun, its atmosphere typically has a very low temperature of minus 201 degrees Celsius. With an axial tilt of 28 degrees, it is comparable to Mars and Earth, which have tilts of 23 degrees and 25 degrees, respectively. As a result, it has seasons that are comparable to those on Earth and Mars. The main distinction is that each of the four seasons lasts for 40 Earth years. The Southern Hemisphere is currently experiencing summer. The Southern Hemisphere has actually become brighter this summer, which is assumed to be a result of interactions with the Sun. Which is odd because you would have assumed that since the Sun is 900 times fainter on Neptune than it is on Earth, it wouldn't have much of an effect from that distance. The brightness of the Southern Hemisphere is believed to be caused by the Southern Hemisphere warming up by roughly 10 C compared to the rest of the globe, even if it may only have a minor impact. In contrast to other parts of the Earth where it is still frozen and remains deeper in the troposphere, this comparably higher temperature has allowed frozen methane gas to escape into the stratosphere. Just to refresh your memory, the troposphere is the lowest layer of the atmosphere, followed by the stratosphere. The mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere are located above those layers. That in itself is a pretty fascinating subject, but we'll keep that for another film. Neptune really boasts the greatest wind speed of any planet, with wind speeds traveling westward on the equator reaching an incredible 2,160 km per hour, almost a supersonic flow. Intriguingly, the majority of wind moves backward relative to the planet's rotation. On the Earth, bands as well as enormous storms form. Voyager 2 observed the Great Dark Spot, an Earth-sized storm sweeping through the planet's atmosphere, when it passed by in 1989. The lesser storm known as Small Dark Spot was also visible south of its larger brother. This storm went from being black to being light as Voyager 2 got closer to Neptune. Astronomers were interested to observe the fate of these storms to determine if they were a permanent feature like Jupiter's Great Red Spot when Hubble was launched. 
However, these storms were gone by the time Hubble was pointed at Neptune in 1999, and storms have been coming and going ever since. The same is true for enormous, brilliant, high-altitude clouds. But if Uranus shares Neptune's composition and size in such close proximity, why doesn't it also have such a windy atmosphere? Don't get me wrong, Uranus too has fast winds, but they can't match Neptune's 900 kilometers per hour. Can the sun and its seasons alone account for all of this? The weather extremes must be caused by something else, though. You would have assumed that since Neptune is the planet that is farthest from the sun that it is also the coolest. The coldest planet in our solar system is really Uranus. While Uranus barely emits any surplus heat at all, Neptune radiates heat from within. This might be due to Uranus losing all of its primordial heat billions of years ago when a huge planet the size of Earth crashed into it. Now, this increased internal heat may contribute to Neptune's more dynamic weather. So what exactly is Neptune made of? It is believed to have an atmosphere and interior structure quite similar to Uranus. 80% of its atmosphere contains hydrogen, 19% is helium, and methane is present in very minor amounts. Although it is a darker shade of blue than Uranus cyan, it is this methane that gives Neptune its blue color. The core is surrounded by a liquid mantle of water, ammonia, and methane ices, just like Uranus. The pressure at the point where the core and mantle collide is so high that methane may disintegrate and diamonds may form as a result. There may be a liquid ocean of carbon with solid diamond bergs floating in it and diamonds showering down in the mantle like hailstones, albeit most likely not diamonds as you and I know them. The pressure around the core of Neptune is thought to be 7 bar, or 700 GPA, or around 7 million times the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere at its surface. This is just a theory, though, as technology is just now beginning to approach replicating such pressures. Even the magnetospheres of the two ice giants are identical. The magnetic field of Neptune is 47 degrees out from its axis of rotation. The initial hypothesis when Voyager 2 discovered this about Uranus was that it had to do with its peculiar axial tilt, but it later turned out that the same thing was true of Neptune, which has a more typical axial tilt. So, according to the accepted hypothesis, the magnetic field is either deflected from the core by the mantle, giving it this odd offset from the rotating axis, or it is generated by an electrically conducting liquid mantle. Even Earth's magnetic north is offset from the location of the North Pole, indicating that none of the planets in the solar system actually have magnetic fields that are precisely aligned. However, the only planets with such a slanted magnetosphere are Uranus and Neptune. There are aurorae on Neptune as well, but they differ from what you might think because they are predominantly type B auroras, or SAR arcs, and they are incredibly faint because the sun's particles aren't getting charged up as much. These do occur on Earth as well, but they are invisible and can only be detected by special equipment. They might cover the entirety of the sky without you even being aware of it. SAR arcs are different since they are located towards the mid-latitudes rather than the poles. Now that we are zooming out from Neptune, we reach its ring structure. Neptune has a ring system like all the other gas giants, however it is relatively faint since it is not very dense and has a very dark color. These rings are particularly difficult to notice since they are so far from the sun and against the black background of space. All five of the known rings have the names of individuals who contributed to the discovery and study of Neptune. The Gal Ring, which is very faint and 2,000 kilometers broad, is the innermost. Luverier, the first shining ring, comes next. Even though it is dazzling, its width is barely 113 kilometers. The Lasso Ring, a 4,000 kilometers wide, extremely weak band, is next and related. The Arago Ring is situated on its edge. Less than 100 kilometers broad, it is slightly brighter than the Lasso Ring. The Adams Ring, the outermost and subject of the most inquiry, comes last. It is one of the brightest rings despite being only 35 kilometers across. 
It is especially fascinating because it is slightly sloped and contains colorful arcs. Despite the fact that planetary rings typically are consistent all the way around, these arcs have been relatively steady since they were first noticed in 1980. The reason for the arc's material clumping and gathering within the ring must be unknown at this time. Finally, I'd want to discuss the moons. There are 14 known moons of Neptune, each bearing a Greek aquatic deity as its name. The moon Triton, which really holds the majority of the mass of all the moons combined, is by far the most well-known and largest. Its magnificent patterns and burnt orange color make it one among our solar system's most beautiful moons, in my opinion. The most intriguing feature of Triton is its retrograde orbit, which suggests it is likely a captured object rather than something that created with Neptune. It also orbits at an angle to Neptune's rotation. Triton may have contributed to the formation of Neptune's rings since it would have disturbed the orbits of the moons, possibly forcing them to clash and fragment into the rings. Triton has a tenuous atmosphere and is larger than Pluto. On its flyby, Voyager 2 even detected a few hazy clouds. Proteus, the second largest moon, is 400 kilometers across, making it larger than Mimas, the spherical moon of Saturn. The moon has had previous collisions with objects that impacted it, causing these enormous craters, which explains why it is not a sphere. The ordinary inner moons, some of which serve as shepherd moons, orbit the rings. All of the irregular outer moons were probably captured moons. Others orbit retrogradely, while some do so progradely. Samothy and Niso, Neptune's outermost moons, are now the planet's most distant satellites. They only orbit Neptune once, and it takes them an enormous 25 years. This is because to Neptune's enormous hill sphere, which is the sphere in which its gravity is greater than the gravity of the Sun due to its already great distance from the Sun, Neptune has a larger hill sphere than Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system. I appreciate you watching, though. Please let me know in the comments what you need. If you appreciate this video, please like it and, if you haven't already, subscribe. Actually, it's your support that keeps us going, so please lend a hand if you can. I'll see you later.